WB. This is the second portion of this, and I'm super excited to bring in Ben Vision, Patrick Burton, and Sue, sorry, Sue Biha. Welcome, give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, judges. I love your shoes, Greg. My name is Patrick Burton. This is my partner, Subin Ha. We are two of the co-founders of Ben Vision. Ben Vision is a project forged in the flames of the MIT reality hack, where we won the accessibility track, working together for inclusivity and equality. And we recently formed a partnership with HTC. Now, you may notice that I'm wearing corrective lenses. In fact, I take for granted every day this marvel of human ingenuity that allows me to navigate my surroundings in perfect clarity while my actual vision continues to deteriorate. But sadly, for 3.2 million Americans, corrective lenses are not enough. By 2050, 8 million Americans are projected to be living with severe vision impairment. So what is XR doing to make sure that these people aren't left behind? Well, not nothing. But the current navigation solutions right now rely on something called meshing, essentially using LiDAR to take your 3D environment and put it into virtual space. It's very cool technology, but when you try to use it for low vision assistance, uh, you run into some problems. First of all, meshing is very CPU intensive, so if you want to run it locally, you need a big battery strapped to the back of your head, probably. Battery strapped to the back of your head, not very fashionable for our users. They probably don't want to wear this anywhere outside their homes. But the other problem is even if they wanted to, they couldn't because meshing falls apart when you introduce moving subjects or changing light. So these solutions aren't really scalable. They're built for controlled environments. Lastly, and this is a mistake committed not only by solutions that use meshing, but these tools are so function forward that they fail to account for a dignified human experience. Let me explain. When we use our eyes, we're not just taking in information about the world around us. If that were true, nobody would stop to watch a sunset. Nobody would gasp when they see a rainbow or become emotional at the magnificence of a beautiful city skyline like the one we have here at San Jose. We use our eyes to appreciate the beauty of the world around us. I'd like to introduce you to Ben, our binaural experience navigator. Now imagine that sonar were a symphony. If every object in your field of vision emitted a beautiful, melodic, distinguishable tone, and that they all harmonize together to create not just music, but an auditory, immersive, synesthetic navigation interface. This is what we're building at Ben Vision. We swapped out meshing for machine learning. And we use object detection in conjunction with advanced audio engineering to effectively transform landscapes into soundscapes. Now, our solution solves all of the problems that were brought about by the previous solutions. But not only that, it addresses a very real problem that's not being talked about enough by the disabled community. Now, we're not the first ones to think of using XR to solve low vision, but we are the only ones who, rather than function only, are starting with the goal of creating a dignified human experience for our users. The world through Ben is not an obstacle course. Watch out for that chair. Don't hit your hip on the table. Don't trip over the dog. No, no, no. <laughs> the world through Ben is a playground, rich with detail and immersive opportunities for interaction. We're creating more than an accessibility tool. We're creating a platform that even full vision people are going to be excited to use with endless opportunities for scalability and commercialization. By the way, don't have to say it, but assistive tech, a lot of money. This is a testimonial that we got from Chris McNally, who was not only our mentor, but a really valuable test subject for us. Um, as a low vision individual himself. I don't have time to read the whole testimonial, but thank you, Chris, if you're here for uh, the kind words and for your valuable input. The last thing I wanna say is that because we are a team formed at a hackathon, we are incredibly diverse. 
Not only do we all hail from different countries originally, but we have a wide array of expertise, including audio engineering, of course, music theory, software engineering, med tech entrepreneurship, marketing and finance, media production, user experience. All of this lives in house with us. So won't you join us on our mission to make accessible tech dignified for everyone? Thank you. Beautiful job. Questions? Um, a plus on storytelling and presentation. Um, I'm a little bit lost as to what the product actually does. So I put it on it. Um, what is it? What does it do? Yeah, maybe it would help if I if I told you about our inspiration. We were inspired. The name actually comes uh, from Ben Underwood, who was a man that was born. Uh, he, he had blindness and he taught himself to navigate using echolocation. So we took that idea and we thought, what if we could meet people halfway and make echolocation a little bit easier and more pleasant and more human? And so this is um, the prototype that we had at the Reality Hack was on um, augmented reality glasses and the user would look around and they would be able to navigate using sound um, coming out of the speakers that are uh, on the glasses. Is this for entertainment or for practical purposes or both? It's for navigation, but we're addressing a real need that, that we think our competitors are kind of overlooking right now. And that's, that's our starting point. So the, the obvious question that pops into my mind is, <clears throat> if somebody doesn't have uh, use of vision, then they're relying much more on their other senses, mm -hmm. uh, hearing being one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, with echo location or some of the other methods I've seen people doing with clicking, it doesn't take up their entire soundscape. It's a second, and then they're hearing the vibration, they're getting information. In this, it sounded like it's a constant kind of melodic background music, which I would think would take away from the ability to hear, to use it, you know, to, to use your ears for other things. Sure. Well, um, so one, one thing that we, uh, we, we thought about that, um, that it might be a little bit overwhelming to be hearing all of the objects around you, which is why we're only focusing the, um, the interface on objects in your direct field of vision. And also we're only focusing on objects that don't move uh, because those are generally the objects that don't make noise already. So people walking around, shuffling around, stuff like that. Um, that that's, you're going to be able to hear all of that um, outside of the interface. But the other thing is that um, this actually positions us really well to be a market leader in augmented reality because we're one of the few use cases that actually makes more sense to wear um, AR glasses rather than try to use it as a mobile device because the speakers, um, they don't cover the ears. This is something that was important to Chris, um, that his ears not be covered so that, so that he can still have an open pathway to the other sounds hap happening around him. Yeah. I'm just talking to my chest. Okay, <laughs> adding to that, uh, we tied uh, object characteristics to the sound qualities so that it can, for example, uh, if the object is bigger, we put lower pitches so that pe people intuitively detect it's like a bigger object. And we also put interactivity so that we put UI sounds on the object so that user can detect if it's an interactable object or not by hearing the sound. But also we can use 3D panning so that you can detect whether where's the object. Also we can, you know, the attenuation so that you can actually sense the distance from myself and the objects. So that's the features that we tie to sound quality to the object characteristics. So I just wanted to confirm there's no hardware component that you're adding to any of the headsets. Correct. We're, we're a software company. Software. Okay. So going, uh, by the way, great mission. Uh, but going back to the sort of the underlying technology, you have to, going back sonar model, right? You, you sort of, you project a sound wave and then you look at the reception and then based on the reception, you construct a 3D environment. And as you know, dolphins and, and others have the unique brain structure to process uh, audio or so sound as the navigation interaction platform. But if I am uh, handicapped, how do you train me to process what different attenuation and the signal strength and the, in 3D distribution mean to me? 
You want to take yes, I actually got that inspiration from my friend. Uh, I went to music school and I got lots of scolding from my friend who has lower vision because he has such a sensitive ear. Uh, so he has more, uh, what is it, sensitive to the sounds than I do. And then I figured uh, actually they can detect more things than what we could do. How to detect that? Like, what does that mean if there's a chair or a mount? So uh, now, uh, in our next aim is you can actually contact, uh, put the sound on it, and then you, if you want to interact it, and then see the how, what kind of object it is. You can actually had nothing head or do some other features, like for example, a like texture or something, put in my fingers, so that you can actually hear what kind of object is from the software. That's what we are aiming to move forward. Thank you both so much. That was excellent. Give them a big round of <laughs> So next up, we have Annabelle Bakaya from Atopia. Hi, I'm Annabelle Vacano, co-founder of Atopia. And I would like to start this presentation today by introducing you all to my grandma. This lovely lady used to love the art. She probably went to a museum or a concert once every week for her entire life. However, for the past 15 years, she wasn't really able to anymore, partly because she got very old, but partly also because she just lived very far away from the next bigger city. Now, this is a fundamental issue. Actually, access to culture has been shown to be key for social inclusion, psychological well-being, and is even one of our human rights. And despite this fact, 12% of the Europeans and 34% of the American population have no access to it. Now, the existing digital solutions that we saw, especially during COVID, seldomly come close to a real cultural experience. However, as we all know, there's a new way of creating true experiences in the virtual room. I'm talking about the metaverse. Imagine you could simply open an app on your computer or put on a VR headset and would be immersed in a city consisting of all the world's museums, galleries, heritage sites and stages. You could go to the Louvre in Paris, afterwards visit the Met in New York and maybe have a drink with your friends at the Trevi Fountain in Rome, all from the comfort of your very home. Now, the existing platforms out there don't really suit to this need. Firstly, because they're often not really built for high quality, which is necessity for those institutions to join. They're often built for creators and not really for visitors themselves, are often speculative markets. And for institutions, it's really important to have a dedicated culture. That's why we decided to found Atopia. Atopia is a platform that's dedicated to the arts. We have expect exceptional quality through leveraging the Unreal Engine 5. We have a curated visitor-centered design, which means only cultural institutions can build on us to ensure that US users will always have an amazing experience. And thirdly, through our specialization of the creative industries combined with the sheer amount of partners working on, we can leverage really strong network effects. Speaking of that, we already have partnerships with 15 of the most renowned arts institutions in Europe. And I'm meeting the biggest, the five biggest museums of the US next week as well. So there's strong demand from the market side. Um, now, how is our business model is quite simple. We basically tackle the B2C side and retain 30% of our revenues are being made. Studies indicate that if you go to a virtual museum, you might not be willing to pay as much as in real life, like 30 euros for the Louvre, for instance, but you are very likely to be willing to pay five euros. We will maintain a share of that. Now, if we look at the market, the verticals we're operating in are massive already. We have over 500 million active metaverse users. Almost 80% of them already make purchases. In the VR industry, we are likely to reach 46 million active installed headsets by next year with a, a revenue growth of the alone B2C VR software market of almost 60%. Now, would these people be interested in visiting museums, you might ask yourself? The answer is yes. Atopia has the potential to be one of the main pillars of the metaverse and of the future. 48% of metaverse users say that art and life entertainment is their main reason to join. 71% of VR users say that they're very interested in visiting culture events or museums through VR. And over a third of the general population is extremely or very interested in virtual concerts, museum, or art tours. So if we combine it together, it's a huge market. Why are we the ones that are able to reach that? Well, 
I used to be a professional violinist before I studied business and worked in cultural management. I worked together with some of the really leading museums and politics uh, on establishing cultural strategies. So I have a really good access to this industry and knowledge about it. Chris is our CMO. He has already four successful acquisitions behind him and always used to be a growth hacker and marketing manager who acquired over 300 million app installs in his previous ventures. He will make sure we will be a massive market for consumers. And Valentin Deal, our third co-founder, is not only a god in tech. He has over six years of full-stack development experience, mostly focusing on 3D environments, but he also, out of a passion, studied history. So. We are currently launched, or we just launched our beta, currently do a pre-seed fundraising round to finalize a platform to acquire the first 10,000 visitors. If you want to join us to revolutionize the way we experience culture, please get in touch. Thanks a lot. It open for all questions. <laughs> um, first of all, I'll say the... Um the diverse backgrounds of the founding team is is great. Like having, you know, I love to see where you have somebody who's, you know, great in tech, somebody who knows user acquisition, somebody who knows the arts. Um, um, tell us about the go-to-market strategy. So where are you going to start? Um, you know, what is the first experience that you're going to have and how are you going to get users to, to try mm -hmm. it out? So we are currently testing the beta in a very low scale to test the multiplayer and everything. But we already have these 15 partnerships. We will have, once we launch, at least 12 of them, but probably 20 of them by the end of the year. We also acquire new ones digitized. So we have, let's say, 20 experiences. And when we launch with these partners, we will... Give us one of those experiences, for example. What? Uh -huh. So, for instance, we have the Deutsches Museum in Munich. That's the most visited museum in Germany. They are technical. They, for instance, create an exhibition which is based on the moon and tells you about, uh, about space traveling. We also have a gallery, for instance, in Munich that will use this for selling artwork. It's a true to original twin for them. They use photogrammetry to digitize their paintings, so you have all the depth and really a quality level that you haven't seen on other platforms so far. And that's how it looks like. You can freely walk through. You have avatars as in all the other platforms, spatial voice chat. Um, and if we go to, or when we go to market, Christopher has created a strategy which will firstly mostly focus on um, social media marketing, mostly on TikTok, because that's where the yeah, most easily addressable target market is on, and also a KPI that's super interesting for museums because they really want to reach young visitors. So um, would it be accurate to say that you're going to these museums and you're, you're, you're leveraging pre-existing experiences that they've already built? Um, they usually have a lot of things scanned, not full experiences, but they usually scan their, for instance, their objects already. We, at this point, we still help them on establishing, let's say, the rooms around it, which is usually quite easy because they're often just white walls, if we're honest, um, and they put it inside. But in the future, we will get them to um, other agencies so they can do that. It's a one-time investment for them. They then upload it freely to our platform. We give them full access to the Unreal API or the agencies that do it for them. So they can reach all of our back end. So they can not only reach the, the visitor community that we're intending to build, but also, let's say, the multiplayer functionality, the UX and everything else. Um, when I when I am paying you as a consumer to attend a museum, am I paying the museum directly or am I paying for a subscription membership to Atopia? At first, for the first probably one or two years, you will pay directly on Autopia, over Autopia, but per visit. That's the by now preferred method for users to pay for virtual events. Um, and we will transfer directly the 70% of that to the institutions. In the future, however, if we reached 50 or more experiences, it will be more lucrative to enable a subscription. On top of that, you can always choose, um, which allows you for, let's say, 10 euros, visit any museum you want as often as you want. Annabelle, uh, in, in terms of the business model scalability, and sort of fast forward a little bit, and let's say target mid-size museum, and they pay you one-time fee to bring him on board, right, and create the environment for them, and then they will, and you'll participate in sales. So what, how are those components, in like, what is the initial amount on average, and, and how do you really scale, at what point this becomes a, say, recurring revenue model 
at say 50k or so per museum per year. Mm -hmm. Um, the main the museum target group is does not have the largest market potential. We rarely scratch the one billion, which is why we decided to really focus much more on accessibility from museums. Um, so we enable them, for instance, also to to um, join our platform for very cheap if they need to. The interesting side of our business model and the really scalable side is the consumer side because any museum is in itself on our platform a scalable product. They do it once and they, as I said, they don't have to do it with us, they can do it with anyone. In the future, we will, we will not work as an agency. Uh, we do that because it pays us a bit at the moment. Um, but we will gain from any visitor that goes to any one of these yeah, um, experiences. So you'll, you'll lower the friction by making it super affordable to bring them on board and really focus on the ticket sales and the volume. That's right. The consumer sector is much more interesting in terms of market potential. Are we out of time? I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. But yes, Thank give, you a lot. give her a huge round of applause. <laughs> Next up, we have Amir Baradaran from ABXR. ABXR engine. <laughs> ABXR engine. Give them a round of applause, everybody. All right. Hello, everyone. Let me set this up. Are we ready? All right. So, from over a decade ago, I was one of the first artists who believed that XR had the potential to change the world. And advocating for the inevitable move from pixels to polygon, I worked with Matteo, perhaps the best company back in the days, who believed in my vision that we could, and they provided me with a team of engineers to allow me to do groundbreaking public art projects. It wasn't easy, to be honest, but I was able to convince the traditional art professionals and some of the largest art publications and art fund and uh, funding institutions to acknowledge for the first time the revolutionary power of XR as in terms of content creation and storytelling. A few years ago, Apple acquired Metario, as so many of you may know. This is how overnight I no longer had access to my army of engineers. So it really dawned on me that making XR was too technical, too expensive, and too time consuming. In other words, XR was inaccessible for creators, the very people we needed to create content for XR. At that point, Dr. Steve Feiner, one of the fathers of AR, recruited me to collaborate with him at Columbia University. And this, is, this really gave me the opportunity to think about a solution for this bottleneck. From Columbia, I went on, oh, I'm not even clicking. <laughs> wow. All right. All right, well, yes, it was technical and too expensive <laughs> and time consuming. All right. Okay, so from Columbia, I went on to pursue my vision, built an exceptional team, designed a powerful tool that's no code to democratize um, uh, access to XR content creation. So let's talk about hardware for a second. We now see an amazing array of uh, XR companies doing a new generation, producing new generation of eyewear, but launching better XR glasses alone in my humble opinion, can't guarantee mass adoption. In the same way, the launch of smartphones didn't really result in mass adoption. So, in fact, it was massive expansion of content in the App Store that made iPhone not only useful, but indispensable. So, beyond Anything in the market, and I'm, I'm, I'm very serious to say that, I'm very happy to say that, ABXR is an AI-enabled, affordable, easy-to-use, no-code tool with the capacity to offer complete end-to-end -end interoperability for the growing XR ecosystem. So what sets ABXR apart from all the other no-code solutions? That's a good question. Let me explain. So think of creating XR as building a house. What do you need? You need strong foundation, windows, bathrooms, kitchen, and so much more, right? Now imagine you're building the dream house of yours, 
but you're only given tools that allow you to build a very small part of that house. So you may end up with a door, and that's really dandy, and it's lovely, and it could be fun for a moment, but not a sustainable place to call home. That's exactly where ABXR comes in handy. Unlike our competitors, we are not just a filter. We provide a holistic approach and a complete XR solution. So with ABXR, you can manage everything, characters, voice, sound, animation, lighting. You can do interactive, interactivity. And not only that, you can test, prototype, and collaborate almost instantly. So, and like YouTube and TikTok, actually you can play, like, share projects, follow each other, and be part of the ABXR community. Now, let's talk about ChatGPT and all the other generative AI solutions that we all love that have exploded overnight. So, well, guess what? With a single sign-on, ABXR gives you the best of generative AI, text-to-speech, text-to-2D image, text-to-3D image, and also we give you, upload your, we let you upload your own video, we transfer it instantly as a 3D animation, and in other words, ABXR automatically improves as other AI improve. All right, was I able, to, were you able to see? Or you weren't able to see it on that, but I didn't press on it. Okay, anyway, you get to see it. I can't fast track it. I'm not gonna lose my, but come for a demo. I'll show you all of it, okay? So, uh, sorry. Sorry. All right. Questions? Yes. I'll, I'll go. Um, so, the challenge from the audience perspective, either investors or potential customers, they all sound the same. Right, no code, easy to get on. 17x means nothing to me, right? 17x of what? You know, 39 minutes. So I, I feel like there's this messaging challenge, not that you're doing anything wrong, just that the, the, there's, I think Matt, Matt said it in an earlier section, there's so many companies sounding very similar. And it's really hard for us to detect who is doing like uniquely differentiated something Right, you talked about your AR stuff, and then you sort of slap Chat GPT on top of it, and then you know dumping content onto the so platform. So for me, you know, given your experience and um, Itaya and, and so forth, how do you really sort of separate yourself? You talked about setting, but in terms of voicing and messaging and and really value proposition. By the way, your UI didn't seem that intuitive based on what you showed us. Uh, how do you really sort of set it apart truly? Because there's so much noise in the market. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, perhaps showing a demo would, would, would do well. Um, so I invite you to come and see us. But just in terms of overall strategy, we are already in um, collaboration with some of the wonderful kind of pockets and niche softwares that exist in the, in the ecosystem that allow you basically to do wonderful stuff. Like for example, Kinetics from France allows you to upload a video and you can do 3D animation. This is major, right? But there's so much- but I don't really, I mean, I know Kinetics actually, but I don't really need you to, to use Kinetics, right? I can all directly use Kinetics. As but that's kind of the whole thing. So this, this is the proposition that we have. We need an, an environment where you can, you don't need to log into 10 different places. You can basically go to one place and everything that is given to you with these wonderful services come under the same roof. More important than that is that a lot of places, a lot of the are kind of um, uh, competitors or no-code solutions, they offer one or three or two elements of what goes into the house building, right? So if you can, if you can just give me filters, it means you, your system doesn't allow for the sophistication that Unity or Unreal allow you to do right now. And this is what we want to try to do, to say we don't need to have engineers anymore. For me, as an artist, to be able to have a team of 10 engineers to do one movement, which by the way, in Unity, takes about 40 hours of coding for your first movement, for a movement of a um, you know, character to go from here to here. We do that in seconds. So the idea is, can we separate ourselves from others? 
I think the best way of doing it is to say yes. And the idea is that you can, you, you provide the right wing and the right wind to the storytellers of our time who are trained to be storytellers, to do the kind of projects that are needed right now to create adoption. And this is really the part that's, that's, that we are trying to pursue. Um, you just mentioned storytellers. Is that the primary customer you're going after? And how are they making money after they've purchased access to your platform? Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually, we are going for um, immediately for, and we are in talks with some of the creative agencies, very large consulting agencies, and we are going for three uh, markets in there. So we're going for branding, marketing, and also professional training. These are three things that these agencies spend basically half a million, if not larger amounts, and they have to build their, their brands even further than that because they have to hire a team of engineers to do the sophistication that our platform allows you to have within a, a, a click or two. So, so that's a very kind of low hanging uh, fruit for us and we have seen it and we are in really, really amazing conversations right now with some of these partners. But we are having, just to explain, so we are having, yes, free to all schools. I, I care about that. I think the next generation of storytellers and artists, they should be part of the XR revolution, right? And, and that's what we're gonna work towards. We're gonna have influencers, programs, and so on and so forth. We are gonna do partnerships with other kind of asset uh, management or asset um, marketplaces as well. So different, different ways of approaching it, yeah. Give Amir from ABXR Engine a huge round of applause. Thank you, Amir. Next, I'd like to introduce Paul Miller from Lemur AI. Good to meet you all. Um, my name is Paul Miller. I'm the CEO of Lemur AI, and I'm excited to uh, talk with you about how we help XR companies scale. We provide video and AI insights uh, to provide feedback on what happens in XR learning experiences so that they can drive learning and additional sales. So the adoption of XR learning is um, hitting an inflection point among enterprise. So we feel that value has been uh, proven at small scale, but now XR companies are facing the challenge of crossing the chasm. So they need to go beyond delighting the early adopters with nice content and beautiful experiences through to satisfying the uh, early majority who want data, they want ROI, they want process fit. So this creates a challenge for XR companies providing training solutions. So the challenges they have are they, they really need to optimize that learning, they need to embed feedback processes within their, their learning experiences, and they need to capture the learning uh, outcomes and the learning progress as it happens. Uh, more, more than anything, they need to demonstrate art, ROI to clients at scale using clear performance data that goes beyond simple usage. So really they need to convince the guys upstairs that they should be investing in that learning solution at scale uh, and not just the product champion that they're working with. And so if they don't meet these challenges, then huge potential revenue opportunities are lost. And it's difficult for XR companies to, to meet these needs, so their development teams might be really focused on, on the content and creating beautiful experiences. So to make that shift towards the analytical side can be uh, time consuming and costly. So this is where Lima AI comes in. We have a, a, an SDK, um, a virtual camera SDK to capture video of XR experiences, and that is fed through our AI analytics platform uh, to provide actionable insights in terms of the learning that's happened. Just to delve into that a little more, so our virtual, virtual camera SDK can extract video from XR sessions without any lag on PC VR or on standalone devices. That's then sent through our AI platform, which is essentially a series of micro bots providing individual pieces of feedback on, in terms of what's happened in the video. So this works from generic um, general AI that's been trained down and can very quickly be trained into specific scenarios whether that's related to soft skills or processes, medical processes, for example, we can train those down very quickly to recognize certain steps or certain features of, of interaction. And then ultimately that is taken, that the video and the data 
uh, sent to our scalable reporting platform and made available enterprise-wide. Or it can equally be fed out via API to uh, learning management systems. So in terms of the wider ecosystem, where we see our sweet spot is uh, on the right-hand side there in the, in the post-experience part of the XR learning process. So we have NVM companies who are making access to the VR solution easier by providing uh, what's tailoring the setup of the, of the devices, tailoring the setup of the, of the software. XR companies creating beautiful and engaging learning experiences. And we really want to own the post-experience part of that by providing the analytics and the feedback that's going to drive learning at, at scale. In terms of the team, uh, we're three second time round entrepreneurs. So myself, uh, having worked in with Vio, a uh, video analytics company working in the edtech space. Craig, our CTO, uh, is, the, is the best developer he knows, so he says. And uh, essentially, he's been, uh, yeah, he's, he's run a development agency for a long time and has specialisms in visual AI. And Matt, our chief growth officer, is a natural born entrepreneur and grew his own tech business to service over 700 uh, universities worldwide. Um, and we really feel that the time is right, the time is now to act on this opportunity. We know in terms of the market that companies are in, really want to embed uh, and integrate VR learning. Um, you know, there's fantastic growth in, in the market predicted in the next five years. Uh, actually, there, there are real economic reasons why an enterprise would uh, take on VR learning at scale. So it's 2,000 users, uh, VR training takes on parity with e-learning in terms of cost. So, and, and it's widely recognized to be much more effective. So, so there's clear um, benefits there. Um, and finally, we believe there, there's a great deal of partnership opportunities for us to work with quite a fragmented industry, working with several uh, VR companies. Um, so in terms of the business model, that's where, what we're aiming for first, really looking to partner with XR companies to embed and white label our solution into, into theirs so that we can charge them on a SaaS basis. Um, we may work with enterprise clients in the future. And actually, there's a business model out there to um, license access to the, the AI models that we will generate. Um, so next steps, we were looking for XR partnerships and VC partnerships at the uh, pre-seed round. Excellent job. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, questions. That's a delightful buzzer, isn't it? It's lovely, yeah. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> tell us if this is a feature that gets bought for tens of millions of dollars in the next five to 10 years, or is this a company that has the potential to go public and why? Yeah, well, certainly, it certainly is the, the former. So as we work with different XR companies, as the, um, uh, as the industry converges, if you like, then we could easily see Lima AI being a, a, an acquisition target for, for the larger companies that we are, are working with. In terms of taking it beyond that, um, I believe that would be, that would be possible. Um, yeah, I believe, I believe it would be possible. I think you know, we, we, we would really need to own the space and, and have the AI ahead of the game continually, which in terms of the framework that we have, there is the potential to do that. How often are experiences for training or enterprise applications being built without an existing analytics platform already integrated into it? So, so what we understand is the, the analytics they have tend to be around usage. So how often the, the experience was engaged with, which device did it, and that kind of thing. So nothing around like what was actually the performance within the environment, which is the key thing. And so what tends to happen is that they're marrying the usage with the kind of outer experience, uh, you know, the improvement that's seen outside of the experience, whereas uh, it'd be really valuable to see actually what's the improvement that's happening within this experience, both at the individual level for the learner, but also for the, for the enterprise. Um, and that, that's currently not happening as Can far as Can you give me learn. an example of one of the takeaways that would be very valuable for an enterprise client that they would learn from yours and not from the user data? Yeah, of course. So, so for example, soft, soft skills training, if someone's wearing, wearing a headset and going through different scenarios and they're interacting with different uh, avatars, actually the AI would be able to work on the transcript and, and understand the, 
the specific words that, that the users are, are using at different points in the, in the environment, and then that could be aggregated to, to understand, well, you know, for solving customer problems, we're using this language. For introducing ourselves, we tend to be using this language, and is that going to be something we want to change? Do we want to create new training programs to, to work on specific aspects of that? Um, to be honest, I didn't really get it, uh, but um, so maybe Greg was hinting upon that. It seemed like an analytics company, right? Sure. And but also like narrow implementation of analytics company for learning efficacy. And is that a good description of it? Yeah, that's that's the, the primary okay. market. Yeah. And then obviously you have different modes of learning. And in, in the beginning, I felt like you said, hey, give us your uh, training session, learning session. We'll do our you know, computer vision analysis and tell you what shortcomings might be, what the issues are, hmm. based on the video you provide. Is that fair? Or, or looking at the session uh, recording and then? Yeah, so I think it's slightly different. I think, be, so what we would do is uh, offer our um, SDK to XR companies who are creating training experiences, right. and they would then embed that within their environment. So yeah, what I probably missed out, to be fair, was to say that the virtual cameras we provide can be placed anywhere within the environment, and that's going to stream video out from that point in the environment without any time lag or performance lag. So that's giving you the insight in terms of actually what's happening within the experience that's that's not currently happening. Right. So you capture that and you do you scan the video and do segmentation and then determine the motions and so forth. But you also have to understand the context because same motion could be efficient in one learning mode, could be inefficient in another yeah. learning. Yeah. So unlike a general purpose analytics, you know, package, you almost have to custom fit your analytics to every learning mode. Yeah, so something we can do very efficiently. So, for example, we're working with Great Ormond Street Hospital in, in the UK who are interested in just capturing uh, hand washing techniques. So, we're building something that's tracking, tracking that automatically, which obviously works for them but can work for any hospital or any use case in terms of where there's hand washing. And, and, you know, when we're looking at learning in different environments in the healthcare settings, there's lots of different techniques that are going to be transferred in, into different areas. But, Yes, it's a good point that initially there's going to be some, some training, you know, to start with, if we were to work with a company from scratch, they'd be using it with fairly generic models, but then the way our system works is that we can train those models very rapidly using the learning experiences that are happening, okay. if that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> we're still going. We've still got time. I think we're... Yeah. Are you all set? Yeah, okay. we're all set. Okay, great. Well, give everybody, give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Patrick and Anzen Kennedy from Augmented Fantasy. Tabletop games with particle simulation based effects. HD LiDAR scanned 3D terrain. And extremely detailed, fully animated miniatures. tracking cards, no expensive equipment, no loss of immersion. Just drag and drop. All in-game footage from that demo, which you just saw, was recorded using nothing but this phone and the drag and drop pre-alpha mobile application. Through a unique combination of outstanding slam-based mobile augmented reality, online web hosting with native voice chat, and world-class exclusive access to 3D assets and adventures, Drag and Drop is the perfect tool to seamlessly integrate into any game that uses a miniature. Real-world minis and sets are not only expensive, but they're difficult to store, prone to damage, and for all of this remain static and lifeless. In-person gameplay, while preferred, is difficult to coordinate and extremely geographically limited. The current solutions on the market for this have players either choose to completely separate to their own computer monitors or fully immerse themselves in uncomfortable virtual reality for hours. 
In either way, you pick one digital tool case and throw everything else to the side. Our outstanding mobile augmented reality encourages players to continue using everything they have already invested in, as drag and drop gains instant access to hundreds of additional miniatures, set pieces, spell effects, and pre-built battles. Now players can look from across the table or across the globe and see the exact same 3D battle unfold right in front of them. In the past 10 years, Tabletop role-playing games have experienced a massive resurgence in popularity, from Stranger Things to the recently released Dungeons & Dragons movie. Naturally, the market surrounding this hobby has grown increasingly competitive, including game publishers as well as third-party producers of physical minis, playable adventures, and digital tool sets. Drag & Drop not only enhances all of these cornerstones of gaming, but actively encourages them to be used together. Our revenue model will conform to the virtual tabletops in the standard market now, meaning we will have a small uh, monthly subscription base that will gain access to our online lobby hosting features, as well as a monthly asset bundle exclusive to subscribers. And we will also hold an in-app store where users can continue purchasing constantly releasing assets such as 3D models, effects, and the previously completely built battles we've mentioned. This means our target markets lie within both the physical and digital gaming retail spaces. And in just 2022, the top three producers of physical miniatures and terrain made $530 million in revenue, while the top five virtual tabletops made 48 million while still being a very young market. To enter this competitive landscape, we plan on launching our own social advertising campaign, as well as utilizing the enormous following of tabletop role-playing game content creators through sponsorship opportunities. We also plan to continue attending conventions that highlight both extended reality and tabletop role-playing games, extensively doubling our market reach. With an open beta launch of 100 users and a 5% in-app conversion rate, we project Drag & Drop will reach uh, 1 million active users by quarter four of 2026. And as augmented fantasy continues to grow, we will continue adding mind-blowing new features to drag and drop, such as one-to-one -one scalable immersion, physical miniatures featuring automated occlusion, and many, many more. We also plan through continuing to attend these trade shows and events to foster a user base, which not only uh, will be creating their own 3D assets and adventures to share within the drag and drop community, but because Unity is at the heart of augmented fantasy, not only does drag and drop run across all iOS and Android devices now, but it's ostensibly future-proofed and will maintain compatibility for all of the XR hardware this constantly innovating industry will produce. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Questions? First question, father and son? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Proud Papa. <laughs> out of COVID, we had an uh, unexpected cohabitation. <laughs> <laughs> nice way of putting it, diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> so we seized on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And is your background, were you in the gaming industry? Him more so. I am uh, a software engineer by trade. I've been working in startups in kind of the Web3 space lately. I was one of the first. AR producers probably 15 years ago in Denver, I did an augmented reality exhibit in the Santa Fe Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, my first job out of school was, I was recruited by the NTTC, which is a federal agency that helps uh, nationalize, you know, commercialize national technology things from the federal labs. And they were looking for the cool factor. And so I was one of the first people who was looking at trying to shoehorn like visual effects quality models and animation into web delivery. So back, way back then, we were doing real player at like, you know, 300 by 200, and then we grew from there into what could happen. I had a keen eye for the, you know, the emerging technology and things that were happening that would allow us to basically have mass distribution of something. And as the phone processor power went up, um, we basically targeted something now that is looking at the mobile phone as lowering the barrier to entry, and then, as he's saying, it's you know available to all. Cool. And you came from the gaming industry? Um, typically, yeah. So I've spent the last about 10 years not just playing, but writing my own gaming systems and adventures and being deeply immersed in the world of tabletop role-playing game. 
So I know I have a deep fundamental understanding of what would make an effective popular tool and what would be large setbacks that would be large barriers to entry for people in terms of convenience, cost, and all of the other usability factors that kind of come together to make this the perfect add-on tool. And who's going to be helping with user acquisition? Uh, user acquisition will be mainly ourselves through, like we said, the social marketing campaigns as well as uh, advertising sponsorships. Uh, we will have the base model for free, so you can see the quality of the augmented reality and the high detail of the miniatures. Uh, but because we're targeting gaming groups, it is sort of a get one, get all situation. So if the game master is going to deploy this and start playing, it's a hard sell to get everybody to either switch completely to a virtual tabletop or put on a VR headset. Not everyone has the money. But if they can get a free download around the table, they check out how cool it is. Suddenly, that turned from one people to six or 10 people around their group. And multiple people play in many different groups. So it has a social spreading aspect that will take off just through the nature of the game. OK. Um, people are being bombarded in terms of it's very difficult to get people's attention, and user yeah. acquisition has become a science. So my advice is to have somebody on board or have a consultant on board who's really versed in in the science of user sure. acquisition and retention. So one of the revenue, we're we're not averse to bringing on you know people, but we have full equity between the two of us. We have zero mm -hmm. debt. We're self funded. So. We're at kind of a accelerator incubator stage, I think, angel investor, to where absolutely diverse skills and experts who have the science behind some of the you know, targets that we want to hit. We're about content engagement, attack, delivery, uh, deep, narrow dive into an existing community that is already huge. I think, if you want to talk to the... Uh, yeah, uh, I think one of the biggest barriers to user acquisition, particularly for mobile apps or games or something like that, everything is asking for a segment of your time. And in today's industry, everyone is so busy. Asking for five minutes of someone's day repeatedly is incredibly difficult. Our target market are people who are playing role-playing games. They've already dedicated this segment of their lives to sitting down amongst a table with their friends and spend five to six hours a week doing this. We aren't asking for any additional time. We're simply looking to enhance the experience that you're already committing your time and money to. So in terms of user acquisition, not only will it spread, but the fact that we're asking for so little and giving so much, I think, is clear and huge. The root word of animation is anime, which means the life force which literally means to make alive. So plastic miniatures that are one inch. Now, we haven't mentioned it, but scale is no object. Once you go into a visor, we actually already have a one-to-one -one scale immersion feature. If you want to rent a space and sit with your friends and be one-to-one -one scale within it, you can do that as well. Um, you know, lightweight goggles or glasses that are not cumbersome and heavy and battery on the back of the head and some of the other problems we saw with VR tech in general. Eventually, we'll get there, uh, I think. Let's hear it for father and son. Thank you so much. Next up, our final presenter, Jacob Siegel with Afference. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jacob Siegel here. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Afference. Uh, we're new. Haven't been to this conference before. It's great to be here. Uh, and we're neuroscientists who know how to create uh, the sense of touch without pressing on your skin. Uh, Afference is here to power the feeling of touch uh, in the digital world. So we'll start with, with, with our position of this industry coming in from this outside field. We do not need another headset. Uh, even with news today from Meta, news next week from Apple, uh, it's not what's missing, right? 3D content with only sight and sound like we feel today is numb. When we go into headsets, when we experience this digital content, we know it's not real. Uh, the brain is based on this visual and tactile information reaching it at the same time. That's how we understand reality. It's what we've evolved to, to, to know, and it's what my one-year-old is experiencing right for the first time as she grabs things and puts them in her mouth. Right? That is how we know what reality is. And so until we start synchronizing the tactile information with the visual and audio, uh, our, all of our VR, MR, XR experiences will be uh, missing. They'll be, they'll be empty in some of those ways. We can't, our brain won't, won't agree. So 
uh, at Afferents, right, we're creating a virtual reality through this, through direct neural stimulation. That's what we know best as neuroscientists. We, we are interfacing directly to the nerves using these mobile and wearable devices uh, like you see me wearing here today. Uh, how we do this is we stream data out of our, of our three-dimensional digital content. Uh, we're interacting, where the, where the physics is well understood using uh, all the game engines that we're building our, our experiences in. Uh, Bluetooth link to the wearable, and within the wearable, we're interfacing to the nerves. The nerves are electrical. It's happening right now inside of my body. Electrical signals are causing the motions that I'm creating and the sensations that I'm feeling in my brain. If we send information into those nerves in a similar pattern, our brain will feel touch. And what's unique in our situation is that we can create referred sensations. That means I put a ring on your finger here, and you can feel a sensation out on your fingertip. We don't need to press on you. We don't need your skin in order to do that. So we've just gotten started. Uh, we're six months into our pre-seed funding. Uh, we think we, can, we have a roadmap in front of us of product form factors that can create a transparent and mobile experience. Uh, right now, we're building this harness right, that you see me wearing here today, uh, and then we're first demonstrating here in, in private sessions uh, today at AWE. Uh, then we think we can move forward right, with time and money to a wrist-worn device where now all of a sudden your haptic alerts don't need to be from a vibrotactile motor inside of your watch. Right? We, can, uh, we can go directly to, your, uh, to the nerves uh, uh, within your wrist to create uh, those identical uh, sensations with saving uh, power and volume in those wearables. Uh, and then one day we believe we can get to a ring where all of the battery processing radios are all worn on one finger uh, and, and we, can, we, can be, um, we can be moving through our, 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 re our physical realm interacting with digital objects in this seamless fashion. So uh, that concept, that technology should disappear is the fundamental to our, uh, to our company. You, holding controllers while you're immersed in VR, your brain still knows it's holding something and pressing buttons, right? Uh, so we're never gonna be fully immersed when we're holding those things. And as soon as you drop those controllers, you, you lose the haptics, right? The motor is gone. You can't feel the click of the button anymore uh, because you're not holding it. Then other technology, right, covers your skin and presses on you. That's great. It works for those uh, constrained experiences where you need to be uh, within a uh, single space and you're not leaving the room or going out into the physical realm. We're designing for transparent and mobile systems that we can be using ubiquitously. Okay, so uh, it's two of us now. Uh, my co-founder here, Dustin, is a, is a world leading expert in neural interfaces. All of our background and our prior work together was in prosthetic limb design, recreating the sense of touch for people who've lost their hands. We're leveraging all that work, all that technology, and the IP into afferents. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, also an academic by trade, uh, who's built medical devices and brought them to market multiple times before. This is, we, we formed this company because it is time uh, to move this technology out, and we think the market is ready. Uh, we've received press on this ability to restore the sense of touch, and the best quote was from Peter Gwynn at uh, National Geographic, who said, it was like trying to describe a color no one has seen. We're here to move that ability into the XR industry. Terrific. We appreciate your time. Terrific. And I want to make one point. Please stay in your seats. My mistake. We have one more speaker, Dan Lowenthal from Spark. So please don't go. Questions? Good. Um, what, your what is your favorite color? <laughs> um, who are the first customers that are needing this? And I think that's been one of my biggest questions in the hardware side of the gloves and the haptics. Yeah. Um, and just the controller. And the controller's been good enough so far for a lot of the games that have been created. So what is the first use case and who is the first customer for this? For this? Great question. Uh, we're starting in, in this form factor, we think we're best suited for gaming and entertainment industry. So what we're doing first is a technology development cycle where we partner with hardware OEMs and well as gaming content creators, right? Then this product, this form factor can be used in that industry, uh, especially uh, within the VR, XR, hand tracking space, right? You don't have controllers anymore, but you can still feel a laser shooting out of your finger, uh, or you can feel the, the engine rumbling as you're driving the, the car through the streets. 
That's where we start. Those other form factors I described go, go further, right? We're dreaming ahead to when uh, we're going to be uh, interfacing with digital content seamlessly uh, and not necessarily in an entertainment context, but when our, uh, when our text messages show up up here and I need to click, uh, that's when we're moving forward to um, those other form factors. Uh, curious, you uh, in the past have, um, have helped people with, it seems like, who have been, who have disabilities of, of some sort or, or um, um, you know, been injured and um, help them through, through medical devices. Now you're going over to more of a fun kind of entertainment thing. I'm curious, what, what made you want to make that leap? It seems like you kind of have the, the formula for how to create a successful company in the medical space. It's true. Uh, um, great question. The, the point here, or the, the point that we, the reason we started Afference was because we saw, we, we have this ability here in this tiny little niche of prosthetic limb design that, that none of this room is aware of, that all of a sudden the XR industry is in need of. If you want to talk about immersion and presence, then you need to provide tactile information to the brain. We called it embodiment because we were building limbs. But it's the same neuroscience, it's the same problem. And it's only now that the other, tech, other pieces of this puzzle are coming together. We have headsets, like we described. We have hand tracking, like we described. And the missing ingredient to all of those experiences is, uh, is, is the sense of touch. So it was all those things coming together and we were, we were able to prove in our academic research that this, uh, that we could use a wearable, not an implant, because no one's gonna get surgery to play a new video game. So, uh, those things all coalesced last year. We got our financing in the door and we're off to the races. Yeah, so um, you made some somewhat outlandish statements in the beginning saying touch is really the virtual reality. And, and it's just one of the sensation that completes the picture for the brain. I mean, you're a neuroscientist, scientist, I'm not. But you know, if VR is done right with the frame rates and camera angles and camera movement, brain sort of completes the picture, right? And uh, if you have any phobias, you know that VR could be extremely effective exploiting or, or curing it at the same time. I think touch provides a good sensory input to, to really enhance the experience. From a VC perspective, the question is, is this really a big enough market? Mm. Can you really sort of have a component that is going through a 25 or beyond timeline to get into a ring form, and you have to sell millions and millions of them because it's almost like an augmented device, not the core device, like you know, uh, fitness and so forth. So how do you really cross that chasm for you to, to get there? Good, good. The, 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 the analog that we have, right, is, is the haptics that we're already experiencing, right? So the, every, every cell phone, every smartwatch has a haptic alert, right? And it uses a vibrotactile motor to alert your skin that something's happened. Uh, if you didn't have those haptic clues or haptic um, cues while you're typing away on your cell phone, it would be far harder to, uh, to to make that to do that as quickly. We argue that as we move from 2D content on a screen to three-dimensional content around us, as this industry, AWE. Uh, creates those experiences, we will become cumbersome. We'll turn back into my one-year-old who's just learning how to use her hands, right? As soon as we're interfacing with three-dimensional content, we need, that we need that tactile information in order to be as dexterous. And so it's, it's, it's in this moment of time, 2023 till, let's say, 25, 27, um, that this industry will need tactile information more and more. We don't have a screen to press on anymore. And that's why we think Afferents is timed well now. Jacob, thank you. Give Jacob a round of applause. Next up, Sparks, which is a fitting way to finish this set of amazing presentations. Welcome, Dan Lowenthal. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Have any of you have moved to a new home recently? Nice. So when I moved to San Francisco a few years ago, I was shown a lot of empty apartments, empty spaces, and it was very hard to envision my life there. So that's actually how Sparks was born and when Sparks was born. We know that for renters and buyers, it's very hard to unlock the potential of an empty space. 
We know also that for real estate professionals, empty spaces are not selling. And for furniture companies, there is a missed opportunity here because they are not in this game. We know that staging works. A staged apartment will sell for more and faster, but staging is, ex is expensive. We also know that using AR, retailers sell more furniture. My name is Dan Lowenthal. I'm the founder of Sparks. My experience is real estate marketing. And here at Sparks, we create a complete visualization, visualization solution for any real estate property. Let's see together how it works. Using our, our proprietary AR and AI technologies, we turn any empty space into a home in real time. We do it with a very easy three-step process. First, agent scans the space with just a phone, and a 3D model is created. Then we generate designs that fit the space. And next, the magic happens. Sparks is the only solution that positions designs on top of any empty space in real time, helping prospects to, tour, to walk into the future. They can also change designs by functionality, style, and budget. And they can also capture the experience with videos and photos and tour properties remotely. And finally, they can even shop for furniture. With this process, we can onboard any property in any vertical, any market, anywhere. And we support them with the first in industry augmented reality staging for full apartments, full buildings, full communities, and also with the full, uh, full uh, marketing suit, including videos, stage videos, and photos. We have a very challenging use case for augmented reality, which is empty apartments with white walls, limited number of feature points. So we had to build our own engine to overcome on some of the big with big uh, augmented reality challenges. With Sparks engine, we get a very stable, low touch and photo realistic experience. We are already in market, working with these guys, paying customers for Sparks. We already have like thousands of units with them. We provide them all the value of home staging, virtual staging and much more than that. We help them to increase conversion from tools to sign leases and to save a lot on marketing. We charge them set of fees and monthly subscription. We also have a revenue share with furniture. We already have uh, affiliate, affiliation programs with uh, some of the, uh, these uh, furniture companies in place. We are currently focused on the multifamily rental market, but later on, we're gonna to go to all other verticals, so the opportunity here is huge. The go-to-market strategy is go to all the big companies, uh, which represent millions of units. We currently have revenue, initial revenue, and we are uh, operating in four different markets here in the US. Uh, by end of year, uh, the goal is to cross half a million AR, and next year to have like a cross vertical full US support. Okay, terrific, Dan. Um, one last sentence, okay? Oh, one last sentence. <laughs> so we have a great team, very talented team in AR and, uh, and uh, software development, and we are proud to build a solution for the real world problem using augmented reality for the real estate use case. Thank you, everyone. Give Dan a big round of applause. Okay, questions. Uh, are you able to replace the existing marketing budget? Are people like not using services they're already using and coming to you instead, or are you adding an additional service on top of what they are already doing? Yeah, it's a good question. So we are replacing staging. In some cases, they do less model units. In some cases, they don't do model units at all. Besides that, we save them a lot on a virtual staging and virtual tools and, and such other uh, um, thing, tools that they're using in the properties. What has the, um, w tell us more about the relationship that you have with some of the big furniture providers there. You mentioned affiliate marketing. Affiliation with them. programs, yeah. 
So, d so are they producing models especially for you, or are you just kind of, do they have libraries that you can basically access and get paid um, an affiliate fee? Yeah, so, uh, so currently we are focusing more on the real estate partnerships. So with them, we have third, third party affiliation programs. We create the 3D models in our studio. Later on, we're gonna be able to get from them their models. That's what we are speaking with the IKEA to get their models. We're gonna approve the models a little bit to fit this real estate marketing standards, and we can also um, partner with third-party uh, companies that create 3D models. Okay. So I, I was trying to understand the sort of the tech and the tech side. You said you have your, your own design and, and patent filing and so forth. But as you know, there are a lot of slam solutions out there. You can easily scan the, the whole room and everything and then drop 3D objects. Is the secret sauce that you customize it specific for the you know, rental market that you can efficiently drop inventory from Mayfair and other places? Um, it, it's not, it doesn't seem like a technology play versus like a bespoke solution for multi-unit uh, property managers. Um, so the secret sauce, by the way, is that we can get floor plans or scans, design it remotely without being in the space, and then everything is uh, designed in advance. So but your, your video the said the agent first scans the place. Mm -hmm. So that's not the case? So there are two options. Either we get the, get the space by scan or by floor plans. Get, get in the floor plans and we design it. That's the two options we have. Which one is more efficient for you? So for now, for the multifamily rental market, getting floor plans is better for us uh, because we are not yet working. We are doing some pilots with agents, but with this process of scanning. So later on, we're going to be able uh, to go to this, I mean, to, to explore more this market. Right now, with most of the multifamily is partners, we get that floor plans. If it's a small building, old building, they can scan and send us the scans. And, and what's the unit price then if you're dealing with the management company and they have say 12 units, is this, you, you, are you selling them in bundles or one, and how does the pricing sort of, I guess, what have you done on the pricing side to really, to Im improve and accelerate your adoption? So, to, I mean, we started, by the way, with, uh, with charging by units, and today we do it by floor plans, by unique floor plans. So once we design, let's say, five, six, they have the whole building. One other question. When, it was, uh, when, you, when the agent was doing the scanning, was that leveraging Apple's uh, AR tech? Yeah, we're using uh, their framework. Great. Thanks. Terrific. Okay, everybody give Dan a big round of applause. And I, I just also didn't mention this, that there's a networking session happening outside immediately after this, so please don't go. You can hang out and talk and chat. And we encourage you to um, engage with our founders, with our entrepreneurs, because ultimately, whether or not you find your next team member or a person who you can collaborate with, this kind of engagement is what AWE is all about. It's building the, the collective, the village. So I thank you all for being here. Please give all of these founders who put so much into this a huge round of applause. <laughs> Fabulous job. And please, Marco, Maddie, Greg, thank you so very much. All right, have a great evening.